straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. The verdict is in in the federal trial of R. Kelly, the latest on the R&B singer's racketeering trial. Remembering Gabby Petito, how her friends and family honored the 22-year-old at her funeral. You knew Gabby. She was always pretty a happy girl. People would gravitate towards her. And the graphic details of Mark Gooch's Mennonite murder trial, how the attorneys set the tone in their opening statements. The defendant's rifle fired the fatal round into Sasha's head. And a pop star under surveillance without her knowledge. How Britney Spears' father kept tabs on her for years. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Simon Chowdhury in for Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. Now we begin with a guilty verdict in the federal trial of R&B singer R. Kelly. We'll have so much more on that, but first, hundreds come together to celebrate the life of Gabby Petito as a reality TV star joins the manhunt for her fiance. All this as it nears two weeks since anyone has seen or heard from Brian Laundry. Over the weekend, TV's Dog the Bounty Hunter joined in the search effort. As Laundrie maintains fugitive status, Laundrie's parents also handed over personal items to the FBI that will assist in DNA matching. Laundrie was last seen on September 14th when he left his family home to go hiking in a Florida reserve. Well, sources say he left without a cell phone or wallet. And since then, the 25,000-acre property has been searched with dive teams, drones, and dogs. Laundry faces a federal warrant for his arrest after allegedly using a debit card that isn't his, racking up more than $1,000 in charges after Petito's death. Now, investigator Joseph Scott Morgan tells Law & Crime Daily Laundry's DNA will be used for more than just tracking purposes. I think that they have specific DNA that's linkage between him and her death. And they're trying to cover every potential point along the way. He had possession of that van so long and absent her, okay? And they're looking for specific evidence that's gonna be a tie back to this fatal event. Uh, you know, no one knows what goes on behind closed doors, but you know, I think that whatever end she came to and it i think that it's going to wind up being very brutal i think that it actually happened in the van meanwhile family and friends honor gabby petito's tragic life cut short law and crimes and jeanette levy takes us inside the memorial service for the 22 year old mourners some from across the country streamed into a funeral home in holbrook new york on long island sunday to pay their respects to gabby petito's family and to remember the bubbly 22 year old i don't want you guys to be sad to be honest with you you know gabby didn't live that way that wasn't her way gabby's father joseph petito stood shoulder to shoulder with her stepfather and spoke about how proud he was of gabby he said she genuinely loved people Petito said people gravitated toward her because of her personality. Jim Schmidt spoke about his stepdaughter. Gabby, at 22 years old, helped teach me that you can always make money, but you can't make up for lost time. Gabby loved life and lived her life every single day. Gabby Petito's father announced the creation of the Gabby Petito Foundation in her memory. Joseph Petito wrote on Twitter, no one should have to find their child on their own. We are creating this foundation to give resources and guidance on bringing their children home. Gabby Petito was on a cross-country adventure living out one of her dreams when she was killed. Joseph Petito urging people to remember how Gabby lived. I want you to take a look at these pictures here. And I want you to be inspired by God. That's what we're looking for. That's something that I want to see. If there's a trip that you guys want to take, take it now. Do it now while you got the time. And Joseph Petito also said during this service that if people are in a relationship that's really not good for them or the best fit for them, that they should leave it. And that's one of the reasons, or one of the lessons rather, that should come from this. Saima? 
All right, Angela, let's bring in co-host Terry Austin and criminal defense attorney Gigi Gonzalez. But, Angela, I do want to ask you before we get to them, do you expect to hear from Gabby Petito's family anytime soon? Actually, Saima, they're expected to hold a press conference in New York on Tuesday, and they're going to talk more about the Gabby Petito Foundation. So this will really be uh, the first time that we hear from the family since it was announced that her body had been found, aside from, obviously, at the funeral service. And Terry, Gabby Petito was laid to rest this weekend. So what are your thoughts about this difficult and sad service? Well, I think this service served multiple purposes. Obviously, it gave the family an opportunity to mourn, but it gave the public an opportunity to mourn as well. And they gave out prayer cards that said, let it be. And that was a tattoo that Gabby actually had on her. And so I think it was living her voice at this service, and it was enabling people to relate to her. The other purpose was, I think, to make it open, to see if anyone could remember anything or see anything if they, in fact, find Brian Laundry, There is a $30,000 reward out, but I think that's not even going to be necessary because everybody and anyone is going to be looking for him. Yeah, let's talk about the missing fiancé. Gigi, we know Brian Laundry faces charges related to debit cards and bank accounts, but could we expect to see more severe charges if and when he's found? Possibly. Brian is one of the last people that may have seen Gabby alive, and we know that their relationship was becoming more violent in the days leading up to her death. And we also know that the initial report says that the manner of death is homicide. So if the investigation reveals evidence that links Brian Laundry to the death of uh, Gabby, then we will definitely see more serious charges filed against him. All right. Thanks so much for that. Let's turn our attention to international news. And Prince Andrew is served court papers after dodging a sexual abuse lawsuit for weeks. Virginia Jufri says the Duke of York sexually abused her when she was just 17 years old. Jufri says it happened at three different locations, two of which were at properties owned by now deceased pedophile Jeffrey Epstein. Well, the lawsuit was filed in early August, but for weeks, the Duke of York denied the papers were served to him. Last week, his camp came to an agreement with Jew Fries and papers were served. A follow-up hearing is set for October 13th. Well, still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, the trial of Mark Gooch, the former United States airman accused in the Mennonite murder case. But first, a verdict in the federal trial of R. Kelly. The latest in the RB Singer's racketeering trial. We have all that and more still ahead. Hi, this is Dan Abrams with exciting news for all of our law and crime followers on YouTube. You can now get the live Law & Crime Network with YouTube TV for all of your daily live trial coverage, legal news, expert analysis, and original true crime programs. Subscribe to YouTube TV today and then locate Law & Crime in the channel guide. And for only $1.99 a month, you can add the network to your bundle. Watch Law & Crime every day with YouTube TV. We put you in the jury box. Welcome back. Well, the fate of R. Kelly is now sealed as the jury announces a guilty verdict for the famed R&B singer. After nine hours of deliberation, Kelly was found guilty of all charges in his federal trial, including sex trafficking and racketeering. The racketeering charge focuses on the enterprise that Kelly formed for said sex trafficking. Most of the accusers include women who were all under the age of 18 at the time of the abuse. 45 witnesses took the stand for the prosecution, including 11 accusers who all testified to their disturbing experiences with the I Believe I Can Fly singer. Many giving emotional testimony detailing being locked in a room with no food or water and being forced to perform sexual acts. Sentencing is still is set just a few months away on May 4th. Kelly faces life in prison. Now, amongst all of this, Kelly still faces federal and state charges in Chicago, Illinois. 
All right, let's bring back Gigi and Terry. Gigi, Kelly was found guilty on all counts of racketeering and sex trafficking. If nothing else, this stands for great headway in the Me Too movement. Yeah, absolutely. This is definitely um, a conviction that is ultimately going to lend power to the Me Too movement. Here you had incredibly heinous charges that were filed against R. Kelly um, and with multiple uh, victims, dozens and dozens of victims testifying against him. To earn this kind of conviction is definitely a message to the community that this type of violence against victims will not be tolerated. And Terry, what sort of sentencing can we expect for a conviction like this? And what's next that the singer now faces in Illinois? Well, the penalty under the RICO is going to be 20 years. And the penalty under the Mann Act is another 10 years. So he faces multiple decades in prison. He's only 54, so he will be 80-something if, in fact, he gets the maximum for both of those counts. And as far as the charges in Illinois, he faces charges in the Northern District of Illinois, which is a federal court case for child pornography. But he also faces charges in state court in Illinois for sexual abuse. And don't forget, he faces charges in Minnesota as well. And so he is going to be dealing with these court cases for quite some time. And my expectation is that he will be extradited so he can face the charges in these other cases, like we saw with Harvey Weinstein, actually. And Terry, is there anything his attorney should do so, uh, differently with these upcoming cases? You know, I think they better be prepared to deal with a similar type charge of RICO, at least in that federal Illinois case, so they can combat that if they want to defend him at all. All right. Well, coming up on Long Crime Daily, what a security team was asked to do to monitor Britney Spears. Plus, opening statements from Arizona for the man accused of murdering a Sunday school teacher. More on the Mennonite murder trial just ahead. Welcome back to Law and Crime Daily. Well, witnesses were called to the stand in the trial of a United States airman accused of murdering a Mennonite woman. Prosecutors say 22-year-old Mark Gooch kidnapped and murdered 27-year-old Sasha Krause in January of last year. He has pleaded not guilty to charges of first-degree murder, kidnapping, and theft. Krause was last seen shopping for Sunday school supplies near her Mennonite community in New Mexico. About a month later, her body was found near Flagstaff, Arizona. And at the time, Gooch was stationed at Luke Air Force Base in Phoenix, which is only about a two-hour drive away. An autopsy revealed Krauss died of blunt force trauma and a gunshot wound to the head. A crime lab reported that the bullet taken from Krauss's skull was fired from a gun that Gooch had in his possession. Cell phone records put Gooch in the area at the suspected time of the crime. Previous text messages from the defendant show disdain towards the Mennonite community. And in court on Friday, the prosecution claimed Gooch sought out a Mennonite woman and took great lengths to cover up the alleged crime. Conversely, the defense spoke to Gooch's character, detailing his past in a Wisconsin Mennonite community and a higher calling to enlist in the Air Force. What will be clear is that the defendant was there, that he abducted Sasha, put her in his car, and then drove hours away to the area of the Sunset Crater National Monument. Mark was raised in the Mennonite faith. Mark went to church on Sundays in the Mennonite faith, as did all of his family. He went to a Mennonite school, as was the custom and tradition. Uh, so he was raised in all of that faith. Um, so at the time he became of age, Mark decided to go a different direction and not stay there, not stay at the farm, not stay in that community. He decided to go into the United States Air Force. Well, witness testimony is slated to pick back up on Tuesday. And let's bring back Terry and Gigi. Terry, being that Mennonite is both the religion and ethnic group, could the murder of Sasha Krause be considered a hate crime? 
absolutely it can be considered a hate crime, both under Arizona law and under federal law. Under Arizona law, if you can show that the crime was based on their identity, whatever that is, race, religion, you can call it a hate crime. And it's virtually the same under the federal law, Title 18 of USC code. And under that law, if it's race or religion or national origin, you can be prosecuted. And in fact, you can get life in prison if it's a murder, and it's a murder based on a hate crime. So they face some serious charges there for this individual because they might have some evidence, in fact, it looks like they do, that this was based on religion. Well, Gigi, the prosecution alleges Gooch has disdain for the Mennonite community, while the defense says his childhood foundation was built upon the religion. Could that history with the church ultimately help him or hurt him in this trial? You know, if the state is able to prove that Gooch actually did have disdain for the community, it's just going to be the cherry on top, because what's really going to hurt him in this case are the cell phone records, are the surveillance videos, are the ballistic reports and the financial records that are tying him to this heinous murder. And Terry, it looks as though the defense attorney has a, a tall hill to climb here. What kind of things would you want to see moving forward in this trial from the defense side? You know, the defense actually doesn't have to even do an opening. And he did get up and do an opening and try to explain that his character is positive. So I think he's trying to paint a story that this individual is a good person. So that's what the jury's hearing so far. Well, it'll be interesting to see. Again, the witness testimony picks back up on Tuesday. And when we come back, on Earth information in Britney's conservatorship battle, how she was surveillance for years without her knowledge. That's coming up. And welcome back. We're now hearing from the former law firm of attorney Alec Murda, who says, quote, he lied and stole from us. Yeah, a statement to the law firm's website says no one was aware of Alec's so-called scheme or his drug addiction. It reads in part, quote, we were shocked and dismayed to learn that Alex violated our principles and code of ethics. He lied and he stole from us. All this comes weeks after the South Carolina attorney turned himself into police, admitting he orchestrated a botched plan to kill himself. Murda claims an agreement was made to shoot and kill him so his surviving son would receive the proceeds from a $10 million life insurance policy. Murda was shot in the head but survived the incident. Back in June, Murda's wife and other son were found murdered at their South Carolina family home. Murda resigned from his law firm in early September after misappropriation of funds used to support his opioid addiction. Well, now the latest news in the Britney Spears conservatorship battle. A new documentary alleges Spears' father monitored her calls, texts, and browser history. The pop star's conservatorship began in 2008 after a string of public meltdowns. Well, since then, her father, Jamie Spears, has held control of her financial decisions through a legal conservatorship. Well, this conservatorship came to light in recent years through the so-called Free Britney movement, as fans of the singer alleged she was being controlled by her father. In the past two years, Britney has attempted to remove her father from the conservatorship, most recently in June of this year, alleging Jamie Spears was abusive and that he ruined her life. Jamie Spears petitioned to be removed from the conservatorship in early September. Well, a New York Times documentary now claims Jamie Spears asked his daughter's security team to monitor her every move, reading texts through her iCloud account, and even placing a listening device in her bedroom. Well, when the security employee questioned the monitoring, he was told it was for Spears' own security and protection. Well, Spears is due back in court on Wednesday for a conservatorship status hearing. Let's bring back in our legal experts. DG, let's start with you. Brittany has made multiple pleas to remove Jamie Spears from the conservatorship. And now Jamie himself, well, he asked to be removed. What are the odds a judge will grant this request or vacate the conservatorship for Brittany altogether? 
I think it's very likely that they're going to grant the request to remove Jamie Spears from the conservatorship, considering the disturbing facts that have come to light and the fact that the parties are in agreement. I don't see why a judge would uh, disagree with the party's wishes here. Yeah, Terry, from a legal perspective, should a conservator be able to use surveillance like this? I mean, this sounds pretty disturbing. Her father had a listening device in her bedroom. It is disturbing when you think about it, Saima. You can't invade someone's privacy the way that her father apparently did so. She has some expectation that she's not going to have listening devices or someone going through her iCloud. So technically, you can have a conservator over the estate or a conservator over the person. Both of those are conservatorships that are supposed to protect the individual. You aren't supposed to be invading their privacy. And I think you can argue that there was a conflict here as far as the father was concerned. There was no reason for him to have information regarding her private conversations. He's supposed to be protecting her as far as her money was concerned and as far as some of her medical decisions were concerned. But to get into her private conversation, I think, is an invasion of privacy and a conflict of interest. And Terry, the same question I asked Gigi, do you think this judge will actually grant this request? I think so. I think with all of the public outcry now with Free Britney, with her father voluntarily saying he will step down, and with Britney saying she wants an end to it, the judge will do so. All right. Thank you so much, ladies. And thank you for joining us here on Law and Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America. Have a great day.